Hello and welcome back. It has been approximately half a day since I recorded for you last. And it brings me no joy to tell you that we have reached the end of our James and the Giant Peach journey. But inshallah, we will get started on our new book to be announced soon, momentarily. So where we left off, there had been a lot of chaos. There had been cloud men throwing stuff at the peach. They went through a rainbow. A lot of chaos happened with James and his friends as they attempt to make their way back to land. Where they're going, they don't seem to know. They are at the mercy of a flock of seagulls, literally. So, the sun is coming up where we left off and we're looking to see where we are going next. All right, let's get started. Chapter 32. And when full day daylight came at last, they all got to their feet and stretched their poor cramped bodies. And then the centipede, who always seemed to see things first, shouted, Look, there's land below. He's right, they cried, running to the edge of the peach and peering over. Hooray, hooray. It looks like streets and houses, but how enormous it all is. A vast city, glistening in the early morning sunshine, lay spread out 3,000 feet below them. At that height, the cars were like little beetles crawling along the streets, and the people walking on the pavement looked no larger than tiny grains of soot. But what tremendous tall buildings, exclaimed the ladybird. I've never seen anything like them before in England. Which town do you think this is? This couldn't possibly be England, said the old green grasshopper. Then where is it? asked Miss Spider. You know what those buildings are, shouted James, jumping up and down with excitement. Those are skyscrapers, so this must be America. And that, my friends, means that we've crossed the Atlantic Ocean overnight. You don't mean it, they cried. It's not possible. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. Oh, I've always dreamed of going to America, cried the centipede. I had a friend once who... Be quiet, said the earthworm. Who cares about your friend? The thing we've got to think about now is how on earth we're going to get down to earth. Ask James, said the ladybird. I don't think that should be very difficult, James told them. All we'll have to do is cut loose a few seagulls. Not too many, mind you, but just enough so that the others can't quite keep us up in the air. Then down we shall go slowly and gently until we reach the ground. Centipede will bite through the strings for us one at a time. Chapter 33. Far below them in the city of New York, something like pandemonium was breaking out. A great round ball as big as a house had been sighted hovering high up in the sky over the very center of Manhattan. And the cry had gone up that it was an enormous bomb sent over by another country to blow the whole city to smithereens. Air raid sirens began wailing in every section. All radio and television programs were interrupted with announcements that the population must go down into their cellars immediately. One million people walking in the streets on their way to work, looking up into the sky and saw the monster hovering above them and started running for the nearest subway entrance to take cover. Generals grabbed hold of telephones and shouted orders to everyone they could think of. The mayor of New York called the president of the United States down in Washington, D.C. to ask him for help. And the president, who at that moment was having breakfast in his pajamas, quickly pushed away his half-finished plate of sugar crisps and started pressing buttons right and left to summon his admirals and his generals. And all the way across the vast stretch of, the, of America, in all 50 states from Alaska to Florida, from Pennsylvania to Hawaii, the alarm was sounded and the world went out that the biggest bomb in the history of the world was hovering over New York City, and that any moment it might go off. Chapter 34. Come on, centipede, bite through the first string, James ordered. The centipede took one of the silk strings between his teeth and bit through it. And once again, but not with an angry cloud man dangling from the end of the string this time, a single seagull came away from the rest of the flock and went flying off on its own. Bite another, James ordered. The centipede bit through another string. Why aren't we sinking? We are sinking. No, we're not. Don't forget the peach is a lot lighter now that, than when we started out, James told them. It lost an awful lot of juice when all those hailstones hit it in the night. Cut away two more seagulls, centipede. Ah, uh, that's better. Here we go. Now we are really sinking. Yes, this is perfect. Don't bite any more centipede or we'll sink too fast. Gently does it. Slowly, the great peach began losing height and the buildings and streets below began coming closer and closer. Do you think we'll all get our pictures in the papers when we get down, the ladybird asked. My goodness, I've forgotten to polish my boots, the centipede said. Everyone must help me to polish my boots before we arrive. Oh, for heaven's sake, said the earthworm. Can't you ever stop thinking about... But he never finished his sentence. For suddenly, whoosh, and they looked up and saw a huge 
four-engined plane come shooting out of a nearby cloud and go whizzing past them not more than 20 feet over their heads. This was actually the regular early morning passenger plane coming into New York from Chicago. And as it went by, it sliced right through every single one of the silken strings. And immediately the seagulls broke away. And the enormous peach, having nothing to hold it up in the air any longer, went tumbling down towards the earth like a lump of lead. Help, cried the centipede. Save us, cried Miss Spider. We are lost, cried the ladybird. This is the end, cried the old green grasshopper. James, cried the earthworm. Do something, James, quickly, do something. I can't, cried James. I'm sorry, goodbye. Shut your eyes, everybody. It won't be long now. Chapter 35. Round and round and upside down went the peach as it plummeted towards the earth, and they were all clinging desperately to the stem to save themselves from being flung into space. Faster and faster it fell, down and down and down, racing closer and closer to the houses and streets below, where it would surely smash into a million pieces when it hit. And all the way along Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue and all along the other streets in the city, people who had not yet reached the underground shelters looked up and saw it coming. And they stopped running and stood there staring in a sort of stupor at what they thought was the biggest bomb in all the world falling out of the sky onto their heads. A few women screamed. Others knelt down on the sidewalks and began praying aloud. Strong men turned to one another and said things like, I guess this is it, Joe, and goodbye, everybody, goodbye. And for the next 30 seconds, the whole city held its breath, waiting for the end to come. Chapter 36. Goodbye, ladybird, gasped James, clinging to the stem of the falling peach. Goodbye, centipede. Goodbye, everybody. There were only a few seconds to go now, and it looked as though they were going to fall right in amongst all the tallest buildings. James could see the skyscrapers rushing up to meet them at the most awful speed, and most of them had square, flat tops, but the very tallest of them all had a top that tapered off into a long, sharp point, like an enormous silver needle sticking up into the sky. And it was precisely on top of the needle that the peach fell. There was a squelch. The needle went in deep, and suddenly there was a giant peach caught and spiked upon the very pinnacle of the Empire State Building. Chapter 37. It was really an amazing sight, and in two or three minutes, as soon as the people below realized that this now couldn't possibly be a bomb, they came pouring out of the shelters and the subways to gape at the marvel. The streets for half a mile around the building were jammed with men and women, and when the word spread that there were actually living things moving about on the top of the giant great round ball, then everyone went wild with excitement. It's a flying saucer, they shouted. They are from outer space. They are men from Mars, or maybe they came from the moon. And a man who had a pair of binoculars to his eyes said, They look pretty peculiar to me, I'll tell you that. Police cars and fire engines came screaming in from all over the city and pulled up outside the Empire State Building. 200 firemen and 600 policemen swarmed into the building and went up into the elevators as high as they could go. Then they poured out onto the observation roof, which is the place where tourists stand, just at the bottom of the big spike. All the policemen were holding guns at their ready, with their fingers on the triggers, and the firemen were clutching their hatchets. But from where they stood, almost directly underneath the peach, they could actually see the travelers up on top. Ahoy there, shouted the chief of police. Come out and show yourselves. Suddenly, the great brown head of the centipede appeared over the side of the peach. His black eyes, as large and round as two marbles, glared down at the policemen and the firemen below. Then his monstrous, ugly face broke into a wide grin. The policemen and the firemen all started shouting at once. Look out, they cried. It's a dragon. It's not a dragon. It's a wampus. It's a gorgon. It's a sea serpent. It's a proc. It's a manticore. Three firemen and five policemen fainted and had to be carried away. It's a snaw's wanger, cried the chief of police. It's a wang doodle, yelled the head of the fire department. The centipede kept on grinning. He seemed to be enjoying enormously the commotion that he was causing. Now see here, shouted the chief of police, cupping his hands to his mouth. You listen to me. I want you to tell me exactly where you've come from. We've come from thousands of miles away, the centipede shouted back, grinning more broadly than ever and showing his brown teeth. There you are, called the chief of police. I told you they came from Mars. I guess you're right, said the head of the fire department. At this point, the old green grasshopper poked his huge green head over the side of the peach. Alongside the centipedes, six more big strong men fainted when they saw him. That one's an oink, oink, screamed the head of the fire department. I just know it's an oink or a cockatrice, yelled the chief of police. Stand back, men, it may jump on us at any moment. What on earth are they talking about? The old green grasshopper said to the centipede. 
Search me, the centipede answered, but they seem to be in an awful stew about something. Then Miss Spider's large, black, murderous-looking head, which to a stranger was probably the most terrifying of all, appeared next to the grasshoppers. Snakes and ladders, yelled the head of the fire department. We are finished now. It's a giant scorpula. It's worse than that, cried the chief of police. It's a vermiculous canid. Oh, just look at that vermiculous, gruesome face. Is that the kind that eats fully grown men for breakfast? The head of the fire department asked, going white as a sheet. I'm afraid it is, the chief of police answered. Oh, please, why doesn't someone help us to get down from here, Miss Spider called out. It's making me giddy. This could be a trick, said the head of the fire department. Don't anyone make a move until I say. They've probably got space guns, muttered the chief of police. But we've got to do something, the head of the fire department announced grimly. About five million people are standing down there on the streets watching us. Then why don't you put up a ladder, the chief of police asked him. I'll stand at the bottom and hold it steady for you while you go up and see what's happening. Thanks very much, snapped the head of the fire department. Soon there were no less than seven large, fantastic faces peering down over the side of the peach. The centipedes, the old green grasshoppers, Miss Spiders, the earthworms, the ladybirds, silkworms, and the glowworms. And a sort of panic was beginning to break out among the firemen and the policemen on the rooftop. Then all at once, the panic stopped and a great gasp of astonishment went up all around. For now, a small boy was seen standing up there beside the other creatures. His hair was blowing in the wind, and he was laughing and waving and calling out, Hello, everybody! Hello! For a few moments, the men below just stood and stared and gaped. They simply couldn't believe their eyes. Bless my soul, cried the head of the fire department, going red in the face. It really is a little boy, isn't it? Don't be frightened of us, please, James called out. We are so glad to be here. What are those others beside you, shouted the chief of police. Are any of them dangerous? Of course they're not dangerous, James answered. They're the nicest creatures in the world. Allow me to introduce them to you one by one, and I'm sure you will believe me. My friends, this is the centipede, and let me make it known. He is so sweet and gentle that, although he's overgrown, the Queen of Spain again and again has summoned him by phone to babysit and sing and knit and to be a chaperone. When nurse is off and all the royal children are alone, small wonder, said a fireman, they're no longer on the throne. The earthworm, on the other hand, said James, beginning to expand, is great for digging up the land and making old soils, old soils newer. Moreover, you should understand he would be absolutely grand for digging subway tunnels and for making you a sewer. The earthworm blushed and beamed with pride. Miss Spider clapped and cheered and cried. Could any words be truer? And the grasshopper, ladies and gents, is a boon in millions of millions of ways. You have only to ask him to give you a tune and he plays and he plays and he plays. As a toy for your children, he's perfectly sweet. There's nothing so good in the shops. You've only to tickle the soles of his feet, and he hops, and he hops, and he hops. He can't be very fierce, exclaimed the head of all the cops. And now, without excuse, I'd like to introduce this charming glowworm lover of simplicity. She's easy to install, on your ceiling or your wall. And although this smacks of eccentricity, it's really rather clever. But thereafter, you will never, you will never, never, never have the slightest need for using electricity. At which no less than 52 policemen cried, if this is true, that creature will get some fabulous publicity. And we have here Miss Spider with a smile of thread inside her, who has personally requested me to say that she's never met Miss Muffet or her charming little Tuffet. If she had not, if she had, she'd not have frightened her away. Should her look sometimes alarm you, then I don't think it would harm you to repeat at least a hundred times a day. I must never kill a spider. I must only help and guide her and invite her in the nursery to play. The police all nodded silently, slightly, and the firemen smiled politely, and about a dozen people cried, Hooray! And here's my darling ladybird, so beautiful, so kind, my greatest comfort since this trip began. She has 400 till children and she's left them all behind, and they're coming on the next peach of the can. The cops cried, she's entrancing. All the firemen started dancing and the crowds all started cheering to a man. And now the silkworm, James went on, whose silk will bear comparison with all the greatest silks there are in Rome and Philadelphia. If you would search the world through from Paraguay to Timbuktu, I don't think you would find one bit of silk that would compare to it. Even the shops in Singapore don't have the stuff. And what is more, this silkworm had, I'll have you know, the honor not so long ago to spin and weave and sew and press the Queen of England's wedding dress. And she's already made and sent a waistcoat for your president. Well, good for her, the cops, cry cops cried out, and all at once a mighty shout went up around the Empire State. Let's get them down at once. Why wait? Chapter 38. Five minutes later, they were all safely down. 
and James was excitedly telling his story to a group of flabbergasted officials. And suddenly, everyone who had come over on the peach was a hero. They were all escorted to the steps of City Hall, where the mayor of New York made a speech of welcome. And while he was doing this, 100 steeplejacks armed with ropes and ladders and pulleys swarmed up to the top of this Empire State Building and lifted the giant peach off the spike and lowered it to the ground. Then the mayor shouted, we must now have a ticker tape parade for our wonderful visitors. And so a procession was formed. And in the leading car, which was an enormous open limousine, sat James and all his friends. Next came the giant peach itself. Men with cranes and hooks had quickly hoisted it on to a very large truck, and there it now sat, looking just as huge and proud and brave as ever. There was, of course, a bit of a hole in the bottom of it, where the spike of the Empire State Building had gone in. But who cared about that, or indeed about the peach juice that was dripping off out of it onto the street? Behind the peach, skidding all over the place in the peach juice, came the mayor's limousine. And behind the mayor's limousine came about 20 other limousines carrying all the important people of the city. And the crowds went wild with excitement. They lined the streets and they leaned out of the windows of the skyscrapers, cheering and yelling and screaming and clapping and throwing out bits of white paper and ticker tape. And James and his friends stood up in their car and waved back at them as they went by. Then a rather curious thing happened. The procession was moving along, slowly along Fifth Avenue, when suddenly a little girl in a red dress ran out from the crowd and shouted, Oh, James, James, could I please have just a tiny taste of your marvelous peach? Help yourself, James shouted back. Eat all you want. It won't keep forever anyway. No sooner had he said this than another 50 children exploded out of the crowd and came running onto the street. Can we have some too, they cried. Of course you can, James answered. Everyone can have some. The children jumped up onto the truck and swarmed like ants all over the giant peach, eating and eating to their heart's content. And as the news of what was happening spread quickly from street to street, more and more boys and girls came running from all directions to join into the feast. Soon there was a trail of children a mile long chasing after the peach as it proceeded slowly up Fifth Avenue. Really, it was a fantastic sight. To some people, it looked as though the Pied Piper of Hamlin had suddenly descended upon New York, and to James, who had never dreamed that there would be so many children as this in the world, it was the most marvelous thing that had ever happened. By the time the procession was over, the whole gigantic fruit had been completely eaten up, and only the big brown stone in the middle, licked clean and shiny by 10,000 eager little tongues, was left standing on the trunk. Chapter 39 and thus the journey ended, but the travelers lived on. Every one of them became rich and successful in the new country. The centipede was made vice president in charge of sales of a high-class firm of boot and shoe manufacturers. The earthworm, with his lovely pink skin, was employed by a company that made women's face creams to speak commercials on television. The silkworm and Miss Spider, after they had both been taught to make nylon thread instead of silk, set up a factory together and made ropes for tight rope walkers. The glowworm became the light inside the torch on the Statue of Liberty, and thus saved a grateful city from having to pay a huge electricity bill every year. The old green grasshopper became a member of the New York Symphony Orchestra, where his playing was greatly admired. The ladybird, who had been haunted all her life by the fear that her house was on fire and her children all gone, married the head of the fire department and lived happily ever after. And as for the enormous peach stone, it was set up permanently in a place of honor in Central Park and became a famous monument. And it was not only a famous monument, it was also a famous house. And inside the famous house, there lived a famous person, James Henry Trotter himself. And all, of, all you had to do any day of the week was to go and knock upon the door and the door would always be open to you and you would always be asked to come inside and see the famous room where James had first met his friends. And sometimes, if you were lucky, you would find the old green grasshopper in there as well, resting peacefully in a chair before the fire. Or perhaps it would be Ladybird who had dropped in for a cup of tea and gossip, or the centipede to show up a batch, new batch of particularly elegant boots that he had just acquired. Every day of the week, hundreds and hundreds of children from far and near came pouring into the city to see the marvelous peach stone in the park. And James Henry Trotter, who once, if you remember, had been the saddest and loneliest little boy that you could find, now had all the friends and playmates in the world. And because so many of them were always begging him to tell the story again and again of his adventures on the peach, he thought it would be nice if one day he sat down and wrote it as a book. So he did. And that is what you have just finished reading. So I hope you liked that. That is a great story. 
So James had his happy ending and millions of friends and visitors far and wide and all of the people in the peach became successful and rich. So one thing you might notice about Roald Dahl's books is they tend to be a little bit dark. They tend to be a little bit sad, but they tend to also end very happily. So remember in Matilda, her family wasn't very nice to her and neither was Miss Trunchbull. And in this case, we have uh, two evil, evil aunties, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker, who treat him terribly, but he made his journey. And now he's got friends and he's got people who love him in his life. So I hope you enjoyed that and keep an eye out for our next story, which is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by request of my good friend Haley over in Cambridge, England. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye, guys.